thank you so very much for being here. I'm going to begin the evening by, um, by asking John Snake, who is cultural coordinator of the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, to please come up because he has very kindly agreed to begin things in the right way. Thank you, John. Anin Bojo. John Snake Disnikaz, Chippewa Zawama, Georgina, uh, Donjaba, Averia Mimai Indayang, Majika Gigo Dodum. Our greetings, uh, friends and relatives. Uh, we're asked uh, to be here to do the opening. I'm not here to welcome you. Our chief will do that. But uh, my brother here, uh, James Simcoe, my relative, is going to light up uh, one of our medicines to help clear the air and uh, to purify our mind, body, spirit, and heart so we can bring our minds together as one. And then after that, we are going to uh, offer up a, a song to, to help with this uh, conference uh, for the remainder of the days. And it's a real honor to be here. I got offered uh, one of our other medicines at SAMA, which is the first medicine. And my brother here is lighting up some sage that sits in the west, that uh, buffalo sage. And then we have that sweet grass, that's another one of our medicines, and, and then that cedar. So those are those four sacred uh, medicines. So he's just going to kind of clear the air and uh, clear the room. I know we can't uh, um, take care of everybody. It'll, it'll, it'll take time. But, but we can smell that medicine and we can, we can just go like that and bring it, bring, bring it on. <laughs> I, I, can, I can use a lot more than that myself. <laughs> but you know, over, over uh, uh, 40 years ago, um, I can remember running around this, uh, this place here. And I came here with my grandfather. Uh, his name was Joseph Allen Snake. And he, he, he came from... Uh, Georgina Island, First Nations, and came over this way and married my grandma. Her, her name was uh, Eva uh, Martel, and then she became a snake. And so I come from both places. And, uh, and I used to run around this place in here, and my granddad would come here to listen to some spiritual leaders speak. Uh, people that have gone home to where we come from in that western doorway, that place we call heaven you know, or that spirit world. And I used to run around here and uh, peek my head in here once in a while. And there were pe people speaking in here like Albert Lightning from Alberta. People like Ernest Tatusis from Alberta. People like uh, uh, Tom Porter, um, Art Solomon. You know, just to name a few, you know, and, and Joe Yellowhead from our community, the late Joe Yellowhead. He was a herbalist medicine person. And they used to have uh, uh, gatherings like that in, in this room. So we're going to uh, very early 1970s, 71, 72. And my uncle sitting over there, Mark Douglas, he was here in the 60s. I, I don't think it was Woodstock. <laughs> At least I hope not. I don't mean to pick on you, uncle. But uh, anyways, uh, my, and then we're going to sing a song, and uh, we're going to send that up. I, I think that uh, I, I'm not an elder myself, even though I grew up with them. But I do work as a cultural coordinator in the Chippewa Zarama, and I didn't want that position. 
I didn't even want to be up here. But uh, um, we have to learn to step up to the plate when we're called upon. You know, we have to. Um, our old ones are doing their work on the other side. So before I came in here, I prayed. And I laid down that Samo that I asked permission and asked for that help from my relatives to come and join us. And uh, like I say, I can't welcome you to this territory. That's my chief's job. And uh, so I, I thought that, I thought about my aunties. When they visit each other all morning and they drink tea and eat some biscuits and cookies and some bannock, they wouldn't say anything. Nothing. And in the end of it all, I can hear my aunties say, oh, I had a real nice visit with my sisters. It took me like 40 years to understand that, you know. I didn't hear anything said. And what I got from that, after those 40 years, hearing comments like that from my, my great aunts, is you can visit each other without even saying anything, and that's real nice. And it took me 40 years to understand that, you know. So I thought that thinking of them and thinking about that, that they were together and they communicated with each other without saying anything. And they were smiling and they shared tea, cookies, biscuits, and, and fry bread. Oven bread, I should say, if I can remember correctly. And said, ease, I had a nice visit with my sisters. So I thought that maybe we can open this up together with maybe having a silence and, and thinking about why it is that we're here. Why it is that we care. Why it is that we're thinking about this world in this place called Geneva. Um, and, and thinking about our grandchildren. I, I, my youngest granddaughter is two. And, and I see her running around and happy and smiling face. And, and I worry about her. I never thought I'd be doing that. <laughs> Getting, you know, getting old. <laughs> thinking like that, you know. Thinking like how our grandparents used to think about us. And I think that's why we're here, you know. And uh, uh, the Haudenosaunee people have a saying, um, you know, um, they greet you with a good mind, right? a, a good, healthy mind. And, and they also say, let's put our minds together and be as one. And, uh, you know, that's one of their greetings. So, you know, I thought that if we can come together and put our minds together and think about why it is that we're here and, and think about our grandkids, I, I think we can do this whole prayer thing together. And then after that, then me and my brother here will, will sing, a, send a song up to, to officially open up this uh, gathering as soon as he gets over here. But, but that's okay. Take your time, brother, because it looks like everybody wants some. So I, I thought I'd share a few words. I didn't mean to carry on this way. You never know how it's going to go. But we're going to be okay. I remember when I was in our early teen over in Syracuse, first time I ever met Chief Oren Lyons at the Longhouse on my travel days. Still traveling. And uh, I think he was one of the first men to speak at the Geneva Convention, I think around 1976 or 77. But if you hear him talk today, he'll say, Business as usual is over. It's over. Mother Earth will still be here, but will we? Right? You know, I get it. Because I think that's why we're here. Because my mother, your mother, is not well right now. 
and we got to take care of her. So what is it that we're going to do for the inheritance of our grandchildren? James, you, James, you better go back out and get these tightened up. Right? <laughs> do. You know, this song that we're going to sing, uh, you never know what you're going to sing, but this song that we're going to sing has actually been adopted as one of the North American uh, most sung flag song in North America. And, and uh, who, brought, who helped to bring this song out, believe it or not, was President Truman. And uh, it was just after uh, uh, Korea, Korean War was almost over. And there was this gentleman named Max Neuer. That's one of the things when you're with old people and sing, you know, singers and stuff, they give you times, dates, when this song was composed, when it was, you know, right? So you listen, eh? So, so Max Neuer was a Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, many Purple Hearts. And he wanted to be buried beside his non-native wife in the Illinois area. Now, this is before the marches of, uh, of uh, Martin Luther King and, and all that. Max Neuer was to be buried beside his wife, and she passed before him. They say he was such a strong warrior that he couldn't, he couldn't carry on no more. But they say they kind of died a broken heart. He really loved his wife and missed her. So when they were burying him, and they were just going to lower him into the earth. Um, the gardener seen it and ran over to his boss. And his boss came over and said, hey, pull that casket up. Why? Why? This is an all-white cemetery. So uh, the, the Arikara uh, relatives that came from North Dakota to bury their brother and their relative were appalled. They couldn't believe it. Because when he buried his wife, his loving wife that he loved so much, he didn't know that. <laughs> he just bought two plots, you know. So, um, and he served in uh, World War II and then later served in Korea. And I believe it was President Truman's last month in office. And he read that in the Chicago Tribune in the White House. And he says, that man's going to be buried beside his wife. I'm going to be there, and it's going to be uh, all full-fledged military service. So he attended, and Max Neuer was to be buried beside his wife in an all-white cemetery. And, and uh, President Schumann says, go ahead, sing your song. And this is the song that was sung, which is one of the most uh, used flag song in North America at most powwows. So I'll use that. Actually, a lot of the singers don't even know that story. Yeah. 
Miigwech, if we can just uh, take a moment, uh, silence, to, to think about why it is that we're here and w what it is that we would like to accomplish, and, and turn it into prayer and, and to think about those ones that don't have anything. Let's not forget that. Those ones that uh, don't have that food that they should have, or that water, or that love, or any of those seven grandfather teachings that we all should have. Miigwech. Thank you, and have a really educational and smiling gathering. Aho. Thank you so very much to both of you. That was really special. It is now my huge honor to ask um, Chief Sharon Stinson Henry who is Chief of the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, to come to the podium, please. Isn't that a tough act to follow? <laughs> uh, miigwech, uh, John and James, for that uh, cultural opening, which is so very important to our, to our community. Uh, my role here this evening, um, Rima and, and delegates, is to uh, bring a welcome. So I say, Anin Kenawea, Endow Gemekwa Sharon Stinson Henry, Dishnakas, Chipozarama, Donjaba, Chmigwech, Gobajayag. I'm really pleased that you're all here this evening. And I'm really pleased that they paved the road for us. Talk about navigating. <laughs> Elders, dignitaries, and there are many here. And Walter, my husband. <laughs> I, I just feel so overwhelmed and honored to be invited amongst you this evening to bring a welcome to the uh, Chippewas of Rama First Nation Territory, also the Menjikining Territory. We have Mark Douglas here this evening with us uh, who sits on the Menjikining Fish Fence Circle and his wife and former Chief Lorraine McRae from the Chippewas of Rama as well. Rama is blessed, has been blessed over our lifetime, our history with great leadership and Lorraine McRae is certainly one of them and I always honor her and I respect her. I'm also proud to say my brother was a chief of, of our territory and our nation for some 26 years. That's another tough act to follow and I don't intend to spend that much time, but I have been honored by my people to be here uh, as your chief. 
I'm also honored and so very pleased to see so many of our post-secondary students here this evening. Please stand up and be acknowledged. Regrets for being here, students. I've, I've prepared notes because I will go on. I'm off topic already. I'm doing things that I really and truly from my heart want to speak about, and that is uh, the, the, the topic of this weekend's conference is phenomenal, and I, I commend uh, uh, Rima Burns-McGowan, the president of the Kuching Institute on Public Affairs, for coordinating this to you and all of your committee members and the staff of the, uh, I guess, the Geneva Conference Center. Congratulations. This is long overdue. <laughs> so over the next few days, there is a stellar, as I said, group of uh, speakers addressing some of the most significant concerns in, um, that our people across the nation are facing. And I'm especially pleased and honored that one of Rama Majikening's members is here this evening and will be over the weekend, uh, the Honorable James K. Bartleman. Please be acknowledged, James. <laughs> where are you? As you, as you know, James is from my community and he was the Lieutenant Governor of this province, this great province, so we are so very honored and proud of you, James, and always will be. We are also uh, very proud of all of the delegates who are participating. I just don't know how you did it, Rima, to have the, 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 the magnitude and diversity of speakers over the weekend to talk about navigating and where we go from here. Uh, I don't know how you did it, but congratulations again. Tonight, you will hear from, uh, or we will hear from Roberta Jameson, a very accomplished Native Mohawk woman who is a lawyer and is currently, um, uh, she supports Inspire, Inspire, uh, which is um, for young, the pursuits of young people in education. Uh, where is uh, Roberta? There she is right in front of me. Please be acknowledged, Roberta. So congratulations to the Kuching Institute on Public Affairs for organizing this conference. It's a timely and essential dialogue. In 1996, the Honorable René de Soult and George Erasmus were co-chairs who wrote the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Affairs, uh, on the Aboriginal Report, People's Report, and it began, began with we began our work at a difficult time, is what they said. It was a time of anger and upheaval. The country's leaders were arguing about the place of Aboriginal people in the Constitution. First Nations were blockading roads and rail lines in Ontario and BC. Innu families were encamped in protest of military installations in Labrador. A year earlier, arrived conflict between the Aboriginals and non-Aboriginal forces at Kananastaqui, Oka, which tarnished Canada's reputation abroad and in the minds of many of its own citizens. It was a time of concern and distress. Media reports had given Canadians new reasons to be disturbed about the facts of life in many Aboriginal communities high rates of poverty, ill health, family breakdown, and suicide. Children and youth were most at risk. It was also a time of hope. Aboriginal people were rebuilding their ancient ties to one another and searching their cultural heritage for the roots of their identity and inspiration to solve community problems. I'm an example or a product of a Native woman who lost her status 
under the Indian Act because I married a non-Native man. Whereas if a Native man married a non-Native woman, the non-Native woman gained status and their children had status. I don't say that to offend anyone. That is just a fact. And I also grew up off my reserve uh, because uh, of family circumstances. My mother, who was a single parent at the time, took us uh, away so that we could get an education and hopefully be able to work and make a living later in our lives. But because of that, and through no fault of hers, it was just circumstances and the way it was, I did not learn my language as I should, but I'm so proud now that our students are learning our language from ECE right up to uh, post-secondary education. So congratulations, Rama. But the goal of the Royal Commission, like the theme of this conference, was to find ways to come together to navigate the relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canada. It would seem that while many efforts have been made to move forward, we are still having some navigational issues today. The Commissioner's snapshot of the landscape in 1996 could be the headlines of today. The Assembly of First Nations is working with the government to address the lack of consultation to address uh, many pieces of legislation finding passage in the House of Commons today. That lack of consultation is what stirs us up time and time again. It has now been revealed that nutritional exper experiments were conducted on our people in residential schools, news of which was just pu publicized last week. An inquiry into our stolen sisters, missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada, well supported by Canada's uh, premiers, is not supported, unfortunately, as yet, by the Government of Canada. So we welcome the inquiry and we welcome the premier's support of that inquiry. Idle No More is a grassroots organization representing our people across North America rising in protest and frustration to the continued facts of life in many Aboriginal communities, high rates of poverty, again, ill health, family breakdown, and suicides. Add continued poor living conditions in many Native communities, as well as uh, contaminated water, chronic underfinancing for government programs, and you can go on and on so we have a lot of work ahead. There are no easy solutions. It sounds trite when you realize how long and how hard we have been attempting to find solutions to those problems. Many of the leaders you will hear from this weekend, and like myself, have sat at tables, faced Canada's officials, who tried to explain what we all know is patently inadequate and unfair in many cases, and offer little of what's needed. And it's not just this government, it's historic governments. Communities like mine have been fortunate to be able to see solutions within our community. My people, the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, are rekindling the spirit that embodies the traditional history and pride of our ancestors. And I see Paul Schilling at the back, who is going to con conduct a sweat ceremony this, this weekend. And I say chimigwech to you, Paul, for carrying on one of our important traditions. I am proud to say that my community, like many others across the country, has developed the tools needed to be successful in this commercially driven world. My council, and I have a counselor here tonight, Tracy Snake is in the audience. Welcome, Tracy. And there'll be others throughout the weekend here as well. But my council is committed to action-oriented initiatives which will move us forward continually to key goals, including business and economic development, planning to ensure diverse investments and projects to sustain our people and our community 
into the future. Community emergent, emergency and pandemic uh, response planning is in place. And James Simcoe, one of our culture coordinator assistants tonight, is one of our fire, he's our fire uh, captain, no, chief, fire, well we have, no, oh yeah, too many chiefs. <laughs> I was a little reluctant to say that, James, but yes, he is a fire chief. So miigwech to James. But we do, we have wonderful emergency services in Rama. Housing, we continue to strive to be and put a focus on, on our housing. I'm proud to say that we have a fully serviced subdivision of 80, which accommodates up to 85 homes. And our housing, our, our, our housing in the community is second to none. We're really very proud of that. We started out with about a list of 200 people, 200 families who needed um, uh, accommodations or, or housing. Um, in the early, uh, two, uh, early late 90s, early 2000s, and um, that list of 200 is now down to about 25. But those folks do have accommodation, they just want better, better. They're, and I'm so happy they have high goals. So RAMA does resound with positivity that continued progress brings. Casino RAMA, and don't forget, Stop in there on your way back. <laughs> it helps our economy. And not just Rama's economy, but the surrounding region. It is an economic engine for this area. It is a premier destination in Ontario and the economic catalyst for Simcoe North. Rama is a partner in a tourism destination known as... Uh, no, we have a partnership, actually, with the St. Eugene... Um, Samson Cree of Alberta and the Tunaha Nation of British Columbia a partnership in the St. Eugene um, Casino uh, and uh, Golf Resort of the Rockies. Beautiful. You'll have to go out there as well. So that's been a successful partnership in that we know we can work together with other First Nations in this country. And, and so I'm very, very proud of that. I'm also proud of the fact that Casino Rama shares its revenues with all of the, pro the uh, other 133 First Nations in the province of Ontario. So we're very proud of that and happy to do it. <laughs> the, this joint venture, of course, sets a new standard for, for First Nations enterprise. Rama recently also announced a partnership with a multi-location bingo enterprise in the GTA. So if any of you live in the GTA, please go and visit our bingo facilities. It helps the economy as well. And recently, Rama began a new economic development initiative which brings solar rooftop projects as part of Ontario's green energy program. That is just a few of the examples of where we are trying to diversify and prosper for our people. None of us can afford to rest on our laurels, though. As chief of the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by a supportive council and dedicated and efficient staff. Together, we have worked hard and see the results in our community with the provision of new housing, as I spoke of, an ECE, the fire, police, ambulance services I talked about, cultural renewal through our culture department with volunteers from our community and elders participating in the circle. Education is very key to Rama First Nation and we do enhance what is provided uh, um, through uh, treaties and uh, fiduciary responsibility of the federal government for post-secondary education. It just isn't enough because we have people going to school. We are able, we can learn, and we can read and write now. We can read those treaties. Whereas before, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, treaties were signed and not honored because perhaps it was thought our leaders of the day didn't understand what they were signing. But they did. 
they would never have given up their resources. They would never have done that. What they did do was welcome the newcomers to this land. What they did do, including our great leader, Chief Yellowhead, Chief Snake, Chief Assans, Chief Tecumseh, is fight for this country called Canada in the War of 1812, along with the British. And I heard it said, this is not my quote, but I loved it. Had they not done that, had our warriors not fought in the War of 1812, Canada would be one more star on the red, white, and blue. And that's the truth. Our people volunteered to fight in all of the world wars. They volunteered. They fought and died for our country, Canada. I currently sit on the uh, National Aboriginal Economic Development Board, which advises the Admi Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern <coughs> Development Canada with regard to policy, programming, and program coordination as they relate to Aboriginal economic development. In this capacity, with leadership from First Nation communities across the country, we offer our experiences and the lessons we have learned we share. And I'm happy to see former Minister of Aboriginal Affairs or Indian Affairs at the time, Chuck Strahl is here this weekend and he's actually in the audience. Where is that minister? Minister Strahl, please stand up. <laughs> so over the next few days, you will hear from leaders who have navigated the issues from very different starting points. Listen intently to all that they have to say. That is the only way, truly only way, to steer our course, to navigate our course in a direction that will serve our people and all Canadians for generations to come. Let us change the story that was included in the 1996 Royal Commission report so that when we meet again, we will marvel at how the anger and upheaval which sparked blockades, sparked idle no more, and armed conflicts. Disturbing reports about the facts of life in Aboriginal communities pointing to poverty rates, ill health, family breakdown, and suicide. Media reports about nutritional experiments, stolen sisters, poor water quality. We look for the change when we look back and we say, those are relics of the past. Instead, let the story be. First Nations, celebrate how our country has finally stopped talking and started acting. In partnership with our communities, our leaders, with all of Canada, including First Nations, benefiting from our natural resources, our lands, our customs, laws, traditions, and wisdom, where we meet as equals and come together as one. Chief Miigwech, thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask our um, keynote speaker to come and join me up here. I have a very few things to say and then I'm going to introduce you. Thank you so very much for those beautiful remarks, Chief Stinson Henry. So, thank you so very much to Chief Sharon Stinson Henry and to John Snake and James very much for your gracious prayer, your welcome from the Rama First Nation, and for your thoughtful remarks. 
Thank you so much for getting this event off to a respectful, prayerful, thoughtful beginning. Welcome to all of you as well from the Kuchiching Institute on Public Affairs, of which I've had the honor to serve as president for the past two years. And Eid Mubarak to those of you who are celebrating, and many thanks to your understanding families for sharing you with us this evening. It is an enormous and heartfelt honor to be able to stand here before you this evening. Those of us who have been drawn again and again to Kuchiching conferences have always known that magical things happen at them. And over the last months, I learned why. Magical things have been happening here in this gathering place for thousands of years. We are tremendously fortunate to be here in a place where people were able to come from different backgrounds and to meet and speak peacefully to overcome their differences. We're tremendously fortunate to be here in this special place to hold this special four-day conversation. I'm going to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, Roberta Jameson, properly in just a moment. But I want first to say a few words about why this conference matters so much. I'm going to say this straight up. I'm very proud of us for doing this. In its 82 years, this is the first time that Kuchiching has done a conference on Canada-Indigenous relations, and it is well past high time. But I am thrilled and humbled and grateful for the enthusiasm with which it has been met. And you heard some of that earlier this evening. Thank you to Miigwech, and thank you to each and every one of our illustrious speakers for taking time out of your busy lives, your summers, and your family time to be with us this weekend. Many of you have come a very long way to do so, and many of you are staying for the whole weekend to be able to have deep conversations in large and small groups. Thank you to Aaron Paquette, to Paul Schilling, and to Bewaben and Travis Schilling for displaying their art over the course of the weekend. And thank you to the Schilling family for the enormous gift of the extraordinary exhibition of Arthur Schilling's five panels, which you will be able to drink in between sessions over the course of the next four days. Thank you to our sponsors, whose names you will see displayed outside. Um, over the course of the weekend and without whom none of this would be possible. The Kuchiching Institute is a charitable organization. All our programming is put on by a dedicated group of volunteers. We fundraise very hard all year to be able to do it, to keep the conference costs as low as we possibly can, and to bring dozens of young people to the conference on scholarship every year. The young people always ask the best most hard-hitting questions, and they're here thanks to all of our partners who understand, regardless of how they view a particular issue, that a healthy democracy thrives on open discussion and even heated disagreement. A deep and heartfelt thank you to everyone who labored long and hard to make this conference work, to the very wonderful program committee and particularly to conference co-chairs Emmanuel Mellis and Leon Thompson, who ensured over many long months that the process of putting it together would be and was as inclusive and as consultative as possible, and who have done a simply marvelous job. To Candy Paltiel, whose passion and brilliance are evidence on ev evident on every panel and in every detail of the conference, to Kathy Manners, who has helped with the coordination of the conference, and in particular, with facilitating the local art and cultural displays, the sweat lodge, and myriad other details of the weekend. To the folks from BASE, and thanks as well uh, to Paul Schilling for both the healing circles that he, one he conducted today, and to his partner, Isana, as well for helping him. Um, for the healing circle that he conducted today, the one he's going to do on Saturday, and for the sweat lodge in advance on, on Sunday. To Roberta Jameson for believing in this project from its beginnings two years ago. 
um, when we first went and said, can we do this? What do you think? And to Ruth Thompson for her guidance, her warmth, and her encouragement all along the way. But my biggest thank you goes to each and every one of you for being willing to be here, for taking yourselves out of your comfort zones, for coming to listen to perspectives and participate in conversations that may be difficult, for being willing to be transformed, for being willing to immerse yourselves in something that really matters this weekend. Because this may just be the most important conference that the Kuchiching Institute has ever curated. It cuts to the very heart of who and what it means to be Canadian. Our history, our present, our sense of who we are and who we want to be. It's difficult to overstate this case. As I've read through my Twitter feed over the past few weeks, it has been impossible not to be struck by the numerous letters and petitions requesting that the federal government release in a timely fashion the archival records and documents that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission needs to complete its work. And this image of the Canadian court-mandated TRC battling the Canadian government for the very documents it needs to be effective is both powerful in itself and a metaphor for the state of the entire relationship. One partner seems still to be in denial that there's a problem at all and would prefer to be off golfing. The other is fed up with pointing out the extent of the problem and is sitting on the golf clubs. And no one is going to be playing any golf until both of them have sat down and had the talk. Many, many talks. But the still hidden documents are also a literal reminder of something that goes far beyond the question of residential schools, as critical and important as that is. The fact is that we in Canada don't know our own history. We don't know the extent to which Aboriginal people have been consistently dispossessed of their land or the extent to which successive governments have broken agreement after agreement, always with the effect of leaving Aboriginal people more marginalized and with fewer resources with which to work. And we don't know the extent to which deeply racist ideas on whose culture, history, and society was worthy and whose was not informed official policies that then dictated who lived and who died and how. We don't know because our governments, our schools, and our media have not been willing to look this history squarely in the eye, call it what it is, and grapple with it head on. When I grew up in Quebec, Aboriginal people were presented in my history books as a quaint but insignificant precursor to what really mattered, the exploits and adventures of explorers and traders and the battles and politics of European settlers and their descendants. That was pretty much it, year after year after year. I'm not sure a lot has changed in the intervening years. And because we don't know our history, we are left with an aching gap where information should be, a gap that is then filled, as such gaps tend to be, with myths and half-truths and a great big lot of looking the other way and pretending not to notice. We need to begin by acknowledging that this is a history we are going to have to own, each and every one of us, all of us, if we are going to confront what is working and what is not working and why it's not working and how to fix it. And fix it we must because much depends on it. Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples is foundational. It is at the base of everything we care about. It cannot be bulldozed over, ignored, or legislated out of existence. Our economic future depends on sorting this out, absolutely, but so does our dream of creating a country that is diverse and socially just and harmonious, the one we tell the rest of the world we have. Our national well-being depends upon it. We need a new conversation. 
And the point of this weekend and this conversation is not to make non-Aboriginal Canadians feel guilty. You can't be responsible for something you didn't do or that was set in place before you were born or that you didn't know about. But you are responsible for what you do here and now. You are responsible for what you acknowledge or what you refuse to see. It is no longer acceptable to say, we didn't know, we weren't told, it was somebody else's fault. We are all responsible for owning our history and for actively working to change the conversation going forward. And that is why we are here today. Many, many people have been working hard on these issues for a very long time. We are truly blessed this weekend that a great many of them are here in this room. And it is a great honor to be among you. And one of these people is here beside me. Roberta Jameson is simply wow. <laughs> she is a great Canadian and a great Mohawk and a powerhouse who has made her own dreams come true and those of many, many others as well through her groundbreaking and ever-expanding work with the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation, now INSPIRE. Roberta was the first First Nations woman to earn a law degree, the first woman ombudsman of Ontario, and the first woman elected chief of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, among very many other firsts. She has been showered with dozens of awards and 22 honorary degrees. She is a member of the Order of Canada. We are truly blessed to have Roberta Jameson with us this evening to frame the next four days and to kick off the conversation. And what we're going to do is to listen to Roberta speak and then we're going to take a 15 minute break and then we're going to come back for questions and answers. And right now, please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Dear, powerful stuff already. Sego, Gano, Ani, Bujo, Bonsoir. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Best greetings to you. And let me begin appropriately by acknowledging uh, with great thanks, Miigwech. Is the chief still here? Sharon. Miigwech, for the welcome, and of course, John Snake, for bringing our minds together. I honor all of you, and I honor the land, the traditional territory of the Chippewa of Rama. I am quite, not quite, I am deeply honored by the invitation to be your keynote speaker in this very distinguished venue where over the years the issues of the day have been discussed and debated. I know it's customary when you're speaking to kind of start out with a few pleasant remarks or a joke. I won't be doing that. <laughs> We've got a pretty serious topic here. And uh, rather, I stand here as your neighbor, your friend, your sister, with a question in my heart, my mind, my soul, which I must ask. 2013, you know, is the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation. Now there's a document that guaranteed the indigenous nations of Canada their lands and that their sovereignty would be fully respected. And here comes 2017, the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Dominion of Canada, fast approaching. Well, the Chippewas of Rama, the Mohawks of Grand River, the Algonquins, the Cree, the Anishinaabe, the Mi'kmaq, the 
Inu, the Salish, the Dene, the Chipewyan, and all the rest of our relatives were, as you know, here when the Dominion of Canada was established on our lands. We'd already been here, in fact, for century after century, back into the distant mists of time. And on this beautiful evening, surrounded by the creation's many gifts, I must ask you a question. Whether your Canada includes sustainable indigenous communities. Does it? You see, throughout the settler history of Canada, no one has chosen to answer that question. Maybe no one has chosen to ask. We were never really part of the settler narrative. As Remus said, the settler vision of their future new nation. For many years, it was, well, they'll move on as the frontier moves forward. Then, when our very existence was at stake, it was, let history take its course. And as we started regaining strength, the message became, let's integrate them. Then, let's integrate them. Then, we'll do a legal cleansing and pretend they don't exist. Then, confusion. Sorry, what was the question? And so I must ask you, as we approach 2017, the birthday party, the ses sesquicentennial of confederation, are we approaching a time of celebration? I'm thinking a lot about this. Or are we approaching a crossroads, one arrow pointing to worsening conditions for indigenous peoples, and another pointing towards a sustainable future? I must ask these questions because I don't know how you might answer them. I must ask because the way the questions are answered may determine the future of my grandchildren. I'm a Duda too, that's grandmother, which is probably the best part of my intro. So it's going to determine the future of my grandchildren. And although you may not have thought about it in this way, the future of your grandchildren, too. I must also ask these questions because I know far too many indigenous communities in Canada are unsustainable in their present condition. Many are on life support. Many have been, well, written off, being provided with bare palliative care. Many are in advanced states of imposed dependency and all that goes with that. I see, unfortunately, languages dying out forever. Once flourishing cultures becoming endangered species. And too often I see the spark in the eyes of too many young children becoming dull and listless even before their teenagers. Their potential unspent, undeveloped, and unrealized. Well, history's left us with some mega problems. In just a few decades after Confederation, an entire people lost almost everything they needed to sustain their lives lost their lands, which drove their economies. Then, as resource development took place, the governments took the resources, outsiders took the jobs, the companies took the profits, geography worked against education and opportunity, and colonialism took freedom, pride, and local control. It should be no surprise, then, that the result is extreme poverty, poor health, despair, and social dysfunction. The current statistics indicate 
that Indigenous communities in Canada are not sustainable in their current condition. Why do I say that? Two-thirds of First Nations children in Manitoba and Saskatchewan live below the poverty line. A First Nations child has a greater chance of going to prison than attending university. More than half the foster children in Canada in care are Indigenous children. And recent statistics show the suicide rate among children and teens in the Inuit homelands is 30 times that of youth in the rest of Canada. Or take education, a field in which I'm most familiar. You know the vast majority of Canadian elementary school students graduate from high school. But the census tells us that only about 53% of Indigenous students, and in many places far less, are able to obtain this most basic requirement. Today, 28% of Canadian students achieve post-secondary education. For Indigenous students, it's 8%. There's a wonderful published report, which you must read, written by Alex Usher. It's full of many more hard statistics of human tragedy and missed opportunity, but also ideas about how all this can be turned around. The statistics in the Usher report are startling. 32% of Aboriginal people 25 to 34 years of age have not completed high school, as compared to 10% in the general population. Only 3% of First Nations people have a university degree, compared to 6% of the broader Aboriginal population and 18% of the general population. Well, worst of all, I don't see sufficient energy, attention, resources making real improvements that are going to lead today to significant change. Let me add one more statistic. Indigenous people are the fastest growing demographic group in Canada. We can't have babies any faster, but we have more. And Statistics Canada tells us that our current 3% of the population that we are will almost double by 2031. So, pretty simple math. Unless we act, the dismal statistics I've mentioned are going to be the same. It'll just be, there'll be more of us. It's really important for us all to know how we got into this situation. So let me recall a bit. If we go back to 1605, the mists of history, there were somewhere between 500,000 and 2 million indigenous people in what today is Canada. As to European settlers in that year, there were 44 French survivors in Cape Royal from the original 79 at St. Croix. Canada's history of European settlement began in those days with the promise of diverse peoples sharing knowledge and resources which had been theirs since time immemorial, as legal language put it. And we know as the colonial enterprise progressed, that promise was replaced with attitudes of superiority and exclusion, resulting as my sister Sharon said, in the marginalization of the indigenous population and the appropriation of the resources on which their well-being depended. Well, the Dominion's Parliament, in their wisdom, passed a law entitled An Act for the Gradual Civilization of the Indians. In 1887, Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald stated and I quote, the great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and to assimilate the Indian people in all respects 
with the other inhabitants of the dominion as speedily as they are fit for the change." End quote. The prime minister proclaimed the destruction of the indigenous systems of government. An Indian could not leave the reserve without a permit. Children were to be removed from their parents and stripped of their identity so as to kill their Indianness. The Sundance, the potlatch, and other ceremonies were punishable by jail sentences. And in fact, by law, any Indian in those days who, wanted to be, who became a lawyer or a doctor or other professional was legal, legally ceased to be an Indian. So we had disease, confinement, martial law, and they had taken such effect that by 1900, 33 years after Canada Day 1867, there were less than 100,000 Indians in all of Canada. In that year's annual report, the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs told the Governor General, quote, the transformation has been wonderful, end quote. As for those survivors, well, we had Duncan Campbell Scott, and he told a parliamentary committee in 1923 that the goal was to get rid of the Indian problem. He said, our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department, end quote. Then in 1927, Parliament passed a law forbidding an Indian from hiring a lawyer to advance claims for land. Well, let's move quickly on to 1969. I remember well. The government boldly stated it planned to amend federal laws to remove every instance where the word Indian appeared. There would be no Indian rights, no Indian reserves, and no Indians. Then Indian Affairs Minister Jean Chrétien called for all indigenous people to become Canadians. In our generation, in my lifetime, in my lifetime. But somehow, at some point, there was a shift. That brings us to our generation. If I could put a finger on the moment that we could allow ourselves to begin to think things could be different, that there really could be a different Canada, I would say it would be the defeat of Chrétien's white paper that I mentioned earlier. And that was accomplished by the sustained efforts of empowered First Nations people and enlightened settler leadership. Shortly after the government gave up that white paper, well, and decided they couldn't legislate away indigenous people, came the government's acceptance of a very important document we had put before Parliament called Indian Control of Indian Education. Then in 1973, there came the Calder decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, which revitalized the whole question of Aboriginal title to land, leading then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau to say, quote, you seem to have more rights than I thought you did, end quote. <laughs> well, we could feel it then. We had direction. We were building momentum. We had traction. We had vision, heart, and strength. And there was not going to be any turning back. No turning back, ever, ever again. Then came the patriation of the Constitution. And once again, we engaged in powerful protests 
In 1981, a train organized by that great leader, George Manuel. He got a train to go from BC to Ottawa. The Constitutional Express, it was called. And it roared across Canada and arrived with the message to government and parliament that our inherent and treaty rights must be recognized in a patriated Canada. Well, the government reversed its decision not to recognize our rights constitutionally, and that bedrock principle became Section 35 of the new Constitution in 1982, just 31 years ago. That same year, Parliament undertook a two-year project, the Parliamentary Task Force on Indian Self-Government, chaired by Keith Penner. I was appointed by Parliament as an ex officio member of that committee with all the privileges except to vote. They wanted to make sure that the First Nations in Canada were heard and there were no Indigenous people in the House of Commons in those days. There had never been such an appointment previously and there has never been one since. The report of that parliamentary task force, the Penner Report, with all its very radical changes, not, was accepted unanimously by the House of Commons. Dust it off. In 1984 came Guerin, a decision by the Supreme Court of Canada, ruling that the special trust responsibilities of the Crown for Indigenous peoples were real responsibilities with legal weight, not mere moral obligations. After that, of course, we had Sparrow, Adams, Miccosoo Cree, and many other court cases, all victories, leading up to the Haida Nation case in 2004 in which the court stated, quote, treaties serve to reconcile pre-existing Aboriginal sovereignty with assumed crown sovereignty, end quote, in my lifetime. And we're just getting started. Well, we're not done yet. There is much work for all of us to do. You and I, and the rest of Canada, until we can say our Canada includes sustainable Indigenous communities. I believe it is necessary to explicitly state that objective. We are less likely to arrive at a planned destination if we don't even agree on what that destination is. And so I must ask you in this historic Kuchiching setting whether your Canada includes sustainable Indigenous communities. And I must tell you, if you want that to happen, we're going to have to work to make it happen. So what are sustainable communities? What's she talking about? Well, sustainable communities are able to educate their children in their culture and their language, to use their potential for the benefit of their community, their nation, and the world. Sustainable communities are safe. They're happy, healthy places, situated in healthy, sustainable environments, places where people care about each other, have supportive relationships, feel connected with each other and the natural world in which they're situated. Sustainable communities have vitality, democratic engagement, accountable governments, economic self-sufficiency. Make your own list of the kind of community you would like your grandchildren to have. Sustainable indigenous communities are all that and more. They are communities of people with healthy identities, 
as indigenous people, empowered by their potential, creating and utilizing opportunities to contribute to their communities and broader society by sharing their gifts. In a sustainable indigenous community, there is an honoring and sharing of an indigenous worldview. There are special ways of knowing about traditional healing, conflict resolution, inclusion of diversity, and demonstrating responsibility to the well-being of the collective. Now, too often, when we speak of indigenous communities, some people have the idea that we're talking about something back in time, frozen in a museum case. And it is true, there are values and ways of being that are eternal. They have served us well in the past and they will serve us well in the future. The sustainable communities I speak of can be located in the northern bush or near metropolitan areas. They will be thoroughly modern and thoroughly indigenous, for we are people of the present and of the future, not relics of the past. So how do we get there? What can we do, you ask? Well, message one. Canadian governments must develop sustainable relationships with Indigenous governments who are accountable to their own people. Canadian people must develop sustainable relationships with Indigenous peoples. Well, how do you go about building those relationships? Mix large quantities of mutual respect, genuine personal concern for children and elders and their circumstances, open, honest communication, a tremendous capacity to listen and hear, acknowledge differences in views, but be open to engage in dialogue to resolve them. I encourage you to go beyond occasional dialogue once in a while thinking about this, to form permanent, cross-cultural and strategic, above all, alliances with the indigenous peoples of wherever you call home. You're gonna to have to leave at home any suggestions of cultural superiority or authority or false pretense or buying your way in this prospect. Message two. There is another word for this cleaning up of our act. Decolonize. Decolonize and decolonize. But don't do it unilaterally, because that'll just repeat the original error. We need to decolonize our institutions and have them reflect a Canada that includes sustainable indigenous communities. We need to decolonize attitudes so we don't have the demeaning comments that appear all too often in the media, relying on comfortable stereotypes. We have to be ready personally to change, to experience personal growth as a result. I'm working hard on my own decolonizing. If we want sustainable relationships, we have to invest precious time, effort, and resources. Message three, let's get dialogue going on this question. Will we explicitly state we want a, cannibal, a Canada with sustain, I need some water, Rima, with sustainable indigenous communities? We're in a situation, I think, that indicates a desperate need for dialogue. And surely, thank you, it's better to dialogue with partners than with strangers. 
So we've got some learning to do. And I urge you not to fear this dialogue. If it comes from the heart, it will become increasingly positive and productive. Of course, you have to understand at the beginning, you may be seen as carrying a lot of baggage. And no amount of your disclaiming it's not your baggage is going to change that perception. Not at the beginning. What will change that perception is you start demonstrating you have no intention to add another regrettable chapter to the Canadian history. So be prepared to listen to demands that somehow might be appearing, you think, from out of nowhere, and gee, they're kind of totally off the wall. Remember such off-the-wall ideas as women should be able to vote. Workers have rights, or that there should be a Bill of Rights. Because agreeing to have sustainable Indigenous communities is that kind of off-the-wall idea. Unfortunately, our generation seems to have inherited the old management and the old rules and tends to resist fundamental change. So our task, we in our time, must transcend that history and together begin writing our future. What will become this generation's history? A new history based on equity and fairness and partnership and respect for each other's rights. For both of us, we must leave our children a legacy we can be proud of. This will enable us to fulfill Canada's promise and will build a Canada with sustainable Indigenous communities. Well, why should we do anything, really? I, maybe some of our friends are asking. Well, I think we should talk to those friends about the business case. Many people are not swayed by social justice but they are by their own self-interest. So let's invite them to have a look at the study from the Center, the Center for the Study of Living Standards. That report demonstrated if we close that gap between Indigenous Canadians and non-Indigenous Canadians in education and employment, we would save $115 billion with a B on the expense side. On the revenue side, Canada would earn more than $400 billion to add to its GDP. That's a pretty powerful argument. Use it. Well, what else can we do? Here's message four. In making our Canada yours and mine, a nation with sustainable indigenous communities. We don't have to start at square one. We have great documents around, studies, reports, and the best one, Sharon just mentioned it, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, 1996. It set out an, ac an account, and I quote, of the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people that is a central facet of Canada's heritage of the distortion of that relationship over time and of the terrible consequences of distortion for Aboriginal people, loss of lands, power, and self-respect. It did acknowledge the relationship has been long troubled and it showed signs of becoming even more troubled in their view. But the commission hoped then, as I do now, that Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike will take the urgently needed decisive steps to repair the damage to the past relationship and to go forward on a new footing of mutual recognition and respect and partnership. The Royal Commission has 200 recommendations, each worthy of discussion. Implementation of the majority of the recommendations would free indigenous peoples from dependency on the institutions on which they currently depend and on the constraints and resources of government. 
This will require, as the Commission realized, justice and generosity. This will also require restoration of fair measures of land, resources, and power. In return will come the restoration of self-respect and self-reliance to replace the anger, despair, and conflict generated by the current situation. Well, in 1996, the Royal Commission proposed a 20-year agenda for change. It did not endorse tinkering with the Indian Act. It did not adore, endorse any shiny new programs. It proposed, as I do, a fundamental change in the relationship, an embracing of Canada's Indigenous reality to liberate the potential of our mutual future. Well, that was 17 years ago. We have yet to begin to set into action that 20-year agenda. Despite the warnings we heard from the Royal Bank of Canada in those days, they published a report called The Cost of Doing Nothing, and they prophetically pointed out that although the cost of implementing the Royal Commission report would be significant, some said $20 billion, the cost of not implementing it would be even higher. Yet with a few minor exceptions, 17 years later, it's unimplemented, little known, and rarely discussed. Well, it's now 2013. In three years, the 20-year plan would have been completed. The Royal Bank was right. The cost of doing nothing would be greater than the cost of doing something. Is this the situation we want to hand to our children? Is this the way to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday? So, I hope you're asking yourself, what can I do to support change, to support ensuring Canada has sustainable Indigenous communities? Well, insist on discussions on those Royal Commission recommendations. Dust them off one by one, get them on the public and political agenda. Start dialogue, engage in dialogue in your churches, your companies, your political parties, Get your governments to dialogue. We're in a situation that indicates a desperate need for change. And as I said earlier, it's better to dialogue with partners than with strangers. We all expect to hold our governments accountable for change. We all must demand our governments act responsibly, sensitively, that they respect the law that they decolonize their relationships. If there is political will, we can achieve great transformation in our generation. Political will is not to be expected of politicians. You don't vote for political will. You create it. We create it. Political will comes from people who cause politicians to act. So let's get active and let's get the corporate sector active and everybody we talk to. Let's encourage governments to incent and reward companies who buy into this. Let's do everything within our power to push this agenda. Let me suggest a couple of maybe personal items for your to-do list maybe some you're already thinking of. I will come to understand that my prosperity at a personal level is tied to whether Indigenous communities are sustainable. I will say to myself, I will ensure that my governments, my representatives, act on this central fact of Indigenous sustainability and understand it is key to Canada's prosperity in the 21st century before us. I commit myself to take steps through my organizations, religious groups, charities, employers, family, service organizations, and so on to enhance their understanding and commitment to sustainable Indigenous communities. I will learn about and support the work of Indigenous communities themselves and their, their organizations. 
so they can make a positive difference. I will develop understanding that any changes in Indigenous communities to be lasting, to be real, must be Indigenous-led, not imposed. But I will also understand that there's a role for me to play. The next time you hear about Idol No More, get out there and join the round dance. Meet some people, smile, enjoy, be comfortable. Whatever you do, be active, be patient, but be persistent. Often the situation Indigenous people face means a limited ability to respond rapidly. Go with those ready to go. Support best practices. Find and use intercultural intermediaries, negotiators, to help two distinct cultures communicate and understand. Discuss, dialogue, smile, talk, listen. This is not a game to watch from the sidelines. Whatever we must do, we must take action. And please, when you hear people talking about another round of statements of commitment and tired rhetoric and memorandum of understanding and agreements to reach agreement, tell them, not now. Now is the time to act. The only new process must focus on how to implement positive action, not talk about it. And there are many fronts, education, health, infrastructure, governance, on which we can take strong, courageous moves. And all these things must be done simultaneously, and I believe Canada is fully capable of it. The one in which I'm most involved is education and training, which I believe is fundamental to success on every other front because unless we improve the educational achievement of Indigenous students, the probability of success for these other initiatives is reduced considerably. Those children and youth are our potential change agents for the future, and so we need to support them so they can achieve and contribute. They'll change their families, their communities, this country, and we will be the richer for it then we'll be positioned to realize that early promise, that opportunity to realize the chance we had at the beginning of Canada's European settlement, the promise of diverse peoples sharing knowledge and resources. From my work at INSPIRE, I have seen so much success. I don't need to rely on hope. We have success everywhere you look in this country. It's not all despair, and that's one thing I want you to take away from this weekend. There are successes. Look at the NISCA. Look at the Mi'kmaq education system, how they're turning out wonderful graduates. Look, out, look at the Cree, what they're doing in James Bay over the last four decades. Remarkable. All great examples that should give us confidence that sustainable Indigenous communities can be a permanent part of Canada's landscape. Look at the Chippewas of Rama. I have full confidence that we can do this in our lifetime, in this generation. It is the Indigenous communities themselves, however, who must be in control of their future. They, we, are entitled to shape our resources, the developments of our land, the nature of partnerships. Every day you're reading a new announcement in the paper, refreshing new announcements for me, where corporate Canada and First Nations are making agreements, where things are moving forward as the First Nation wishes to see it. Not everywhere, but there are some great successes of partnership. And we know that education is critical to that. I'm delighted to say that we've got lots of change agents standing by ready to be engaged. I know of 16,000 of them that Inspire has supported with scholarships and bursaries in this country. 
Last year alone, 142 doctors, 220 nurses, 75 PhDs, 2,200 students in all. These are the change agents that are going to change their communities and this country. Find them, lock arms with them, work with them. They want to give back, and so can you. Our Inspire Award recipients are magnificent role models that inspire us all, and who are still willing to share their ways of knowing with Canada. I'm particularly pleased that the private sector is increasingly engaged. They're ready to explore and commit to resource revenue sharing discussions. Unheard of 10 years ago. Unheard of. And ordinary Canadians are also calling for change. And we all know that Idle No More is engaging them every day. So let's begin today. Let's start now with your own circle, your own family, your own organization. Let me close by sharing a special teaching. As is true of many indigenous peoples, my own people, the Mohawks of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, we are given teachings and we're instructed that in our lives and making our decisions for the future, we must focus our attention not on ourselves, not in our, on our children, not even on our grandchildren, but rather on that seventh generation, we say, whose faces you can still see coming towards us. The seventh generation are our great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren. They're not a figurative or romantic abstraction. They're real human beings, not yet born. The people who are going to call us their ancestors, they have every right to expect that we will realize the opportunity today to put our minds together to improve life for our children and for them. That responsibility to live a life focused on the seventh generation has been a very tough but very powerful force in my own life. I commend it to you for your consideration. That focus has taught me I have both the opportunity and the responsibility to create change. It's taught me that I don't live alone in this world, that we walk with our past, our present, and our common future. It's taught me to seek a longer view whenever I've felt the push of impatience or the immobilization of despair. And if we think of the seventh generation, we'll be pushed to go beyond the mark, to go in new directions, to find opportunities that don't appear when we're thinking of the short term. The seventh generation is here with us in spirit. They are our future, cheering us on. They're the ones who are going to live in a Canada that decided to be a country with sustainable Indigenous communities. I'm sure they'll look back at each of us and they'll be grateful for our efforts to create a better future for them. I would like that seventh generation to say about us, they had a choice and at the crossroads, they opted for us. So, let's do it. Let's build a Canada known for its sustainable Indigenous communities. Let's do it in our lifetime, in this generation, starting now, today. Thank you for listening to my words.